At the beginning of World War II, with the Nazi and the Axis threat from the east looming on the horizon, and then after that fateful day of December the 7th, 1941, and the attack on Pearl Harbor, America had to respond, and America responded in part by its growing industrial might. That might was reflected in declarations made by the United States government and then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt that industrial output, especially for materiel for the war, would, would begin and goals were set. No one in the world believed that the United States could meet those goals, but not only did the United States meet them, but the industrial might of this nation was, was so ignited that in the very first year those goals were exceeded. The factory had already existed, but nothing on this scale. And the factory then began to be such a central part of the American imagination. And most of you have seen those war reels, and virtually all of you know the images of those factories. The invention of the assembly line. And with the assembly line and with the, the functioning gears of all of that machinery and the industrial direction in motion, You've seen those sights of automobile after automobile after automobile leaving the factory, all of them bright and shiny and everyone knowing what they are to do. Airplanes leaving massive factories with their engines and their wings ready and painted, ready for action. And everyone knew what every one of those planes was supposed to do. Those planes all looked like each other as the cars more or less all looked like each other. Henry Ford famously said, my customer can have his car in whatever color he wants so long as that is black. <laughs> car after car after car, plane after plane, tank after tank. For a lot of higher education, that's exactly what the model still looks like. Graduation is when the doors of the factory open and when the assembly line demonstrates its work. Graduate after graduate comes out the line and by the announcement of major and, and, and by the presentation of diplomas for programs, everyone can figure out what this one and what that one is supposed to do. One of the oddest ironies of our gathering this morning is that that picture doesn't work for us. We, we don't see education as something that can be done as in a factory. We don't see commencement day as the opening of the doors of the factory and sending the product out. We don't look at these graduates and say, we know exactly what God is going to do with every one of them for the rest of their lives, because in honesty, we haven't a clue. Individually or corporately, we really do not know all of the promise that is reflected now in this room. But we do know that it's promise. That's what we know. Because this, as a Christian school, as a Christian college, can't look at education like the mass machinery of mass education looks at the same enterprise. We're not merely training for professions, and we're not merely training young people to make some good difference in society, some contribution here or there. We, we don't have charts and graphs of how many of our graduates are doing this and doing that and the way that the world would count. Indeed, we're not here, though, for less, but for so much more. Because in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are here to observe the graduation of these young people prepared for service in the name of Christ for the rest of their lives. Their experience at Boyce College, your experience at Boyce College, graduates, has not been an experience in mass education. It's not been merely a program. We hope and pray it has been a life-changing experience. Education at Boyce College is never directed merely at the mind, although it is unapologetically directed at the mind. It is a, an education based in learning. 
But that learning not only in facts and data and theories and arguments, but we pray by God's grace wisdom. No, the, the educational purpose here is directed not merely at the head, but at the heart. Our greatest hope, honestly, is that the graduates arrayed before us are more different in heart than when they came, than even in their heads. Given the way God made us, we understand those two are linked. But the, the average college or university wouldn't dare get close to the heart. We do not want ever to get far from it. Now, that creates a, a certain complicated dynamic. And that is that our hearts also grow to these students. Now, those of you in this room beat us there. You who are gathered here as parents and brothers and sisters and grandparents and other, other ones who love these graduates, you loved them no doubt long before they arrived here and a part of how they arrived here is because of how you loved them, how you raised them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Their presence on this college is a reflection of your conviction and your hope and your commitment, your love channeled into them. But during the time that they have been here, we have come to love them and to respect them. There's a sense in which when you come to a college graduation, it's a little bit different than anything else. When you, when you look at high school graduation, it's like they're bigger, but they're the same. <laughs> but when it comes to a college graduation, there's a sense they're the same and they're not the same. Those crucial transition years, traditionally between about 18 and 22, are when, in God's plan, human beings tend to emerge as adults. There's a lot going on in those four years. It's a part of the reason why a Christian college is also a place where that should be that should be the right thing that would happen in the right way. And so on this commencement day, I know many of you, parents and other loved ones, you look at these graduates and you're saying, he's the same, he's the same young man we brought, but he's not. And the same thing with the young women. And not only that, by God's grace, some of the young men leave with young women you didn't know <laughs> when they came. And God's glory is in that too. This is the way it works. I'll speak on behalf of the faculty to say that this is a far more emotional experience than you would probably understand or that they had expected. It's because in the process of teaching as God has created us, there's a reciprocity not only of trust and not only an exchange of information, there's a development of affection, and there's tremendous accumulation of hope. One of the ironies of higher education is that we want to keep these young people forever the way you wanted to keep them at home forever, but you couldn't and we can't. And in the way of the Lord, they are now being sent out, and they will go. And God only knows what he's going to do with them. Our hope and prayer, our commitment is that the years spent here in this college have prepared every one of these young people for service beyond their and our imaginations in the name of Christ. I dare say that five, 10, 20 years from now, most of us in this room would be astounded at what God has done through them. And that's not because they're underrated. It's because God has not yet revealed fully what he's going to do in them. Some of them will eventually be on mission fields they did not even have on their imagination. Some of them will be serving in places of ministry. Many of them will be distributed through strategic places of business. Some of them will be in places of influence and responsibility in our society. Some of them will be in government. Some of them will be in law. Some of them will be all across the professions. 
Most of them will be husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. In the twinkling of an eye, as it were, their own self-consciousness will very quickly change from son and daughter to mother and father. And Mary and I would simply say to those of you who right now are mothers and fathers, the only thing better than that is grandmother and grandfather. That too is God's glory. So what do you say to a group of graduates of Boyce College on this day in which they are gathered together for the last time as this kind of assembly? They'll never be gathered together in exactly this way again. This photograph is a moment in time. We're going to rejoice in it. There is great joy in it. But the even greater picture would be if we could frame a composite of years hence to know where they are and what they're doing. This much I know. <clears throat> they will take with them the education they have received from this college. They will take with them the joy of this faculty and their influence in their lives. They will take with them the camaraderie that they have experienced with each other. They will take with them all the experiences that God brought into their lives during this time. We pray that they will take with them their love for the Lord, their love for God's truth. We pray that they will take with them an instinct to study and to trust the scriptures. We pray that they will take with them affection for the local church. We pray that God through them will channel his magnificent passion that the nations would be glad in Christ. I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. I want to direct our attention only to two verses. The last two verses of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul writes, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what do I now say to you graduates? I commend you to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. You came here because of those who had raised you, brought you, sent you, provided for you. You have been here for these years. And now, as it were, we are opening the door and kicking you out. <laughs> there are 18-year-olds planning their dorm rooms right now and you've got to leave so that they can come. Four years later, they're going to be the old people having to give way to 14-year-olds right now who are trying to figure out if they're excited or terrorized about going to high school. This is the way it works. But this is the way Christ's people would consider such. We commend you to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, far more than we can imagine. We are boldly, graciously, with great excitement, we're sending you out to do more than we can imagine because of what this God, the one true and living God, will do through you. And what he will do is more abundant than what we can ask or think. And that's magnificent because we can ask and we can think a very great deal. We can see you having such impact on this world. We can see you reflecting so much of God's glory in this world. But God will actually do through you more than we can even ask or think. He does so according 
to the power at work within us the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel. And Paul's just been writing about this to the Ephesians. This invincible power of the saving Christ who dwells within us, with whom we are united by faith. And it is Christ's power in us that explains how God through us and through you will do abundantly beyond anything that we can ask or think. And, and it will be your responsibility. This is your task. A secular university just says, go seize the day, go find your destiny, go make yourself rich, go make yourself famous. And instead, on behalf of this school and this faculty, I simply wanna say, go out in the world and show the power of Christ beyond anything we can ask or imagine. And you will never be without him. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that also points finally to another difference between this commencement and a secular school and its commencement. In a secular school, the commencement would basically end with, go do what you can to make yourself famous and always remember your alma mater. <laughs> and do so for a number of decades and then retire and make a contribution to our endowment. <laughs> that would be nice, let me point out. Uh, <laughs> But that's not what we're counting on. That's not our great hope from you. No, our great hope is in this crucial difference. We are not sending you out today into the world for a few decades of impact and influence. We're sending you out into eternity in the name of the Christ whose glory in the church will be demonstrated throughout all generations forever and ever. Nothing you do for Christ will die with you. That's a promise that doesn't come from me, but from God himself. And thus, there can be nothing but gain and in this hour, there can be nothing but joy. And so on you graduates, I leave this. The fate of the gospel to the nations, the fate of the, of the, the gospel reflected in rightly ordered churches, the fate of the preaching of the word of God, the, the future of raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the reaching of the nations, the teaching of the church, the demonstration of the glory of God in society, yes, it all now rests on you and on you, your fellow believers. But it will be God working through you. And he's going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we can ask or think. So we're not even going to try to exhaust ourselves in that process. We're going to commend you instead to Christ and to his eternal glory in the church, throughout all creation, forever and ever. Amen. So go. And the hopes and prayers of this seminary and college, faculty and all, will go with you so long as the church may last. Amen.